and a good afternoon to you all. Welcome to the Smart Grid Educational Series for August 2013. My name is Erfan Ibrahim. I'm the moderator for this forum and also the presenter for the presentation today. The title of the presentation today is Fundamentals of Electromagnetic Theory and EM Waves. This uh, is a sequence of presentations, and this is the second of a three-part presentation. I was initially going to do this whole presentation in one shot, but as I prepared the material over the last few days, I realized that if I wanted to do the due diligence on the math and the physics, I needed to give it a little more time. So what I've decided to do is speak today about the more of the theoretical concepts and the math, and then in the next presentation, which I will do in September, I will start applying these principles on the grid to talk about the flow of electricity and how uh, electromagnetic waves carry data and other applications. I'd like to dedicate this presentation to Peter Bergman. Dr. Peter Bergman was a assistant to Albert Einstein at the Institute for Advanced Physics from 1936 until 1941. He was my electromagnetic theory professor at Syracuse University between 1981 and 82. And as a 17-year-old in my junior year at Syracuse University, I found him very inspiring because he had finished his PhD at the age of 21. And I wanted to share a little story with you. My first midterm, I got a B, and I was very, very depressed. I had not seen the letter B on my transcripts in a while. And so I sat there very sad in this room with seven kids. And at the end of the hour, when the other kids left, Dr. Peter Bergman asked me to come up to his desk. And he stood up. And you can see he was about 4 feet 10 inches tall and with a very thick German accent. He said, Mr. Ibrahim, I understand you got a B. He says, when I was your age, I also got a B in my first test. He said, don't do it again. <laughs> and I didn't. And electromagnetic theory and I have been waltzing ever since. And today I'm celebrating that by celebrating his life and his accomplishments. He wrote a book on the theory of relativity, and the introduction of that book was written by Albert Einstein. So I'm very, very privileged to have had him as a professor. And the way he taught with his little hands, without any notes and a textbook, here we are 31 years later. And I still remember the concepts and the way he danced with divergence, gradient, and curl in the classroom. This is a short bio on me. I have gone over it last time, so I won't bore you with it. But basically, I've been involved in physics, in engineering, in sales, in marketing. And I basically did everything that people said I didn't have the skills for until they ran out of excuses. So now I, I can cause trouble in many different directions, and I am putting all of that mischief to use in the smart grid area. The agenda today, we're going to start by talking a little bit about basic electricity and magnetism concepts. We will go further into the mathematical description of those concepts in what is known as vector calculus. So if you understand calculus as single dimensional functions, and then you have multi-dimensional functions, then you get into partial derivatives. And divergence, gradient, and curl, which are the basic functions of vector calculus, accommodate that multiple variable functionality, which is so important when we're talking about electromagnetic wave propagation because it occurs in multiple dimensions. And so after going over some of the basic 
aspects of vector calculus. I'll talk about some of the theorems, the vector calculus theorems, which are so important in understanding the relationship between the point form of the Maxwell's equations and the integral forms. Quite often in freshman physics, we will see the distillation of the integral form in very simple geometries to make it easy for the students. But as you work your way up in any physics curriculum, you begin to see the multidimensionality of electromagnetic theory and therefore the need for vector calculus to describe it. I'll talk about the Maxwell's four equations and show how the point form turns into the integral forms using these theorems from vector calculus. And then I will get into the d'Alembert wave equation, which is essentially an extraction from Maxwell's equations. There are two Maxwell's equations that, by performing some vector calculus functions on them, can lead to the creation of the electric field equation and the magnetic field strength equation, which form the basis for electromagnetic waves, so E and B, electric field and magnetic field. And then I, I will talk a little bit about how you represent electromagnetic waves in space and time. And there will be a graphic display of that. And then I will list some of the next topics where all of these concepts are going to be applied and then follow it up with a Q&A. Let's start with the concept of an electric charge. Essentially, an electric charge basic unit is the charge that is held in an electron or in a proton. In an electron, that is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And in a proton, it's positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Coulomb is the SI, or System International, which is the metric system way of depicting charge. It's a lot of charge. So electrons are the smallest unit of charge, or protons. That means that you cannot have a continuum of charge. There, it's discrete. And that's the smallest unit. So you can't go less than 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb with the particles that exist on our planet. Maybe in some other cosmos it may exist. But here, from what we have observed, that's the smallest unit. And an electric field is created between charges. And that electric field emanates from a positive charge and ends on a negative charge. So these are lines of force. If you bring another charged particle in its vicinity, you will experience a force on it. And that's why these lines are depicted like this. Very similar to the way gravitational lines are depicted, let's say, around the Earth. Coulomb's law says that two charged particles will attract each other if they are opposite, and they will repel each other if they are similar. And this formula shows you how that, those relationships are there between the magnitude of the two charges, the distance between them, and a Coulomb constant, which comes out of some physical phenomena, namely 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. And epsilon 0 is the permittivity of free space. And there is, with this depiction, you can begin to see that as you move charged particles away from each other, the force will weaken. And as you bring them closer together, the force will get stronger. This is why it is so difficult to produce a nucleus of an atom. Because imagine all those protons in such close proximity to each other. So the neutrons are really kept there to stabilize it. And it, there is something called a nuclear binding energy that is much stronger than the Coulombic repulsion potential. And that's why the nucleus stays together. But in a fission reaction, when a new neutron comes and hits a nucleus, it splits. So there, again, nuclear energy is the one that's splitting the nucleus. It's not the Coulombic repulsion. However, when you want to do fusion, and you have to bring two charged particles together, you have to overcome the Coulomb repulsion between them. And that is why it requires extremely high energy such that the kinetic energy of the particles has to exceed the Coulomb potential. 
and that means millions, hundreds of millions of degrees centigrade for some of the heavier elements. Hydrogen can fuse around 100 to 150 million degrees centigrade. So this will begin to show you how this concept of charge is so fundamental and the force between them makes all the difference between whether things stick together or whether they fall apart. There are also molecular forces, attractive forces, van der Waal forces that we study in chemistry that many times can offset this. And that causes, for instance, the formation of colloids that become so heavy that they precipitate. In those situations, the surface charge, the zeta potential, is exceeded by the molecular attraction. So there are many, many examples where the balance between repulsive and attractive forces makes that difference. And we have to understand how to estimate that and then see what other natural phenomena is occurring around it to decide what will eventually happen. The electric field strength is the force per unit charge. So if we go back to this previous slide, if I took a test charge, let's say Q2, and bringing it over to a charge Q1, then the force per unit charge, in other words, F over Q2, will be the electric field that Q2 will experience at that point at a certain distance away from the Q1. So the electric field strength is measured by how much force is applied on a charge per unit charge. So that is, it's a function of how much charge is built up at a particular location and how far away from it you're measuring it. The farther away you go, the weaker the electric field will get. The displacement vector, D, is a measure. Now, when you have two charge plates and you have separation of charge, there's an electric field that is created. And that electric field, if it is a linear and isotropic material, the electric field and the displacement vector D are parallel to each other. And here's an example of that. So the D vector is showing, and by doing some simple manipulation, here the rho is the charge distribution, rho F is the free electron distribution, and rho B is the bounded electron distribution. P is the polarization. So if you go through this math, you see how D and E are multiples of each other. And the epsilon zero, the permittivity of free space, is the coefficient that relates the two. And the chi is the multiplier on the dielectric. So here is an example where you have two charge plates, one positive, one negative. It creates an electric field between them. Now, if you place a material, a dielectric material, that a dielectric material is one where the charge can very easily separate inside the material. So what will happen is the positive charges will come close to the negative plate, and the negative charges will come closer to the positive plate, creating a reverse electric field, essentially, in the cavity between the two plates. And by reducing the electric field, because electric fields are vectors, so they'll cancel each other, you will reduce the voltage between the capacitor plates. And by doing so, what that does, or sorry, you reduce the electric field between the two plates. And by doing that, you avoid arcing. So by this way, you increase the capacity of this capacitor. Essentially, these two charge plates with the separation is a capacitor. And by putting a dielectric material in between, you're enhancing the capacitance of these two plates. And this chi is the multiplier of that dielectric. So if it was free space, the chi would be zero, and you would just have epsilon zero, which is the permittivity of free space. If chi was a number greater than one, that means that it is a more effective dielectric than just vacuum. Here is the relationship between electric field and electric potential. You hear about electric potential in volts. So when you say the voltage is this, you're really talking about the electric potential. And there's a relationship between the electric field and the electric potential. Essentially, the derivative of the potential with respect to space or distance is the electric field. And this shows in these two. If you take Q2 
q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. And you look at v, which is q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r. You see that if you took the derivative of v with respect to r, you would get the function of e. So here it's showing that relationship. And electric field is a vector. It has magnitude and direction. The scalar is uh, the potential, electric potential is a scalar. It only has magnitude, no direction. And if you took a charged particle and you can study how the electric potential and the electric field vary as you go past it. So as you're inside the material, there is no electric field because the charge is on the surface. So there is no electric field in the middle. And so in that area, the potential, the electric potential is constant. Because remember, I said the slope of the electric potential is the electric field. So if the electric field is zero, that means that the electric potential has to be horizontal. So that's why it's horizontal in the middle. And it has a 1 over r drop off on the outside of the charge. And the electric field is zero inside. And it also has a 1 over r squared drop off as you go away from it. So these are the interrelationships. And as I mentioned, electric field is a vector. So if you have two charged particles, Q1 and Q2, and you are standing at a certain location, as shown in this diagram on the right, an electric field uh, is felt by that charge from each of these two charges, Q1 and Q2. And those are the two solid black vectorial arrows. And you do a vector sum to get you the electric field that is created as a result of these two charged particles. Now imagine a sea of charged particles. You would have to take differential elements of all of that charge and figure out what the electric field is at a certain location. That's why you need calculus. This is a very simple example of point charges. If you had a distribution, you couldn't do it without calculus. You'd have to integrate all those contributions together, and that's calculus. Here's an example of, you know, when you say potential difference, like between the live wire and the ground wire is 110 or 240 volts, what does that mean? Here is an example that if you take two positions, RA and RB, as shown in this diagram, you can see the potential difference between them is simply the difference of the potential between one and the potential at the other point. And by using simple math, you can separate out the distance part from the coefficient part and the charge part. So 1 over Ra minus 1 over Rb multiplied by Kq gives you the potential difference between point A and point B. Now, naturally, if you are at point A, you're going to be at a higher potential than at point B and because there's that 1 over R drop-off. So these are very simple ways with point charges that you can begin to understand the concepts of electric potential, electric field, the relationship between them, and how it relates to force. Let's now get into magnetism. There are a variety of ways of inducing a magnetic field. And here are some of those ways. You can run a current in a wire, and it will create a magnetic field that revolves around the conductor. And you can use what's called the right-hand rule, where you take the thumb and you point it in the direction of the conductor carrying the current. And the way your fingers curl is the direction in which the field lines will curve. That same concept can be applied on a loop, in which case you get this magnetic field lines going through the middle of the loop like that. When you have multiple loops in the form of a solenoid, now you have further enhancement of those magnetic field lines inside the solenoid because all those turns are going to help keep the lines of magnetic field concentrated in the middle. And this is something that is used very often in transformers, for instance. You have a solenoid on the primary side and a solenoid on the secondary side. And by the ratio of the turns, you can step up or step down the voltage for AC current. Then you have bar magnets. In this, nature produces materials that have a domains with, as electrons spin, they create a magnetic field. So there's a magnetic spin in atoms 
And when those are aligned in domains, that can create magnetic material. Now, some magnetic material is naturally magnetic, and others are ferromagnetic. So in ferromagnetic, when in the presence of a magnetic field, they will magnetize. But normally, they won't be magnetic. In the case of natural magnets, the domains are locked in. They already have that magnetic nature because all the mm -hmm. electrons are spinning in the same direction in those regions. And so they enhance the magnetic field in that area. And then the Earth has a magnetic field because there are naturally occurring magnets, magnetic materials in the planet, and there's a very weak magnetic field surrounding us. And there are many phenomena of nature that we know uh, that exist as a result of this magnetic field, including the use of compasses when we point and say it's due north. We've actually got the south pole going. So the magnet is backwards. The north pole has the magnetic south, and the south pole has the magnetic north. So it's backwards from geography. So these are some ways in which we have magnetic field lines created. Let's now get into the quantitative aspect of this. So if you have a current carrying conductor and you have induce this magnetic field around it and you have a charged particle that is moving in its vicinity, it's going to experience a force. And that force is represented by QVB sine theta. So this is actually a cross product between two vectors, the V vector and the B vector. So this is the magnitude of it. If you were to write it in vectorial notation, you would write V cross B, and it would be a vector. But we are just focusing on the magnitude. The magnitude is the velocity times the magnetic field strength times the sine of the angle between them. If they were perpendicular to each other, sine of 90 is 1, and it would just be QVB, which is what we learn in freshman physics. But as you apply trigonometry, if the angle were other than 90, this is the formula you would use. And the current, this is Ampere's law in its simplest form that says that the magnetic field strength is equal to mu zero I over two pi R. So mu zero is the permeability of free space here, and that's written next to it. I is the current, and R is the distance that you are away from the conductor. So again, there's a one over R drop off of the magnetic field strength. So when you're really close to the wire, your magnetic field strength is gonna be high. And as you go away from the wire, it'll get weaker. And so therefore the force that a charged particle will experience in the close proximity to the wire will be much higher than farther away because B is dropping. Now, if you run more current, you're gonna get stronger magnetic field. And these are some of the effects that uh, you can experience when you have conductors carrying a lot of current because the magnetic field associated with them will affect you, especially if it's an alternating current. And there's a relationship between the speed of light, C, which is a constant, and the two coefficients. One is the permittivity of free space and the other one is the permeability. And this is the relationship, that C is 1 over square root of the product of the two. Let's now talk about what this magnetic force is. We call this the Lorentz force. There are two aspects to it. There's an electric component in the Lorentz force, and there's a magnetic component. The electric component is just the force that it feels due to an electric field if there's one around. So that's QE. And QVB is the magnetic force. So force, since force is a vector, it'll be the sum of the electric component and the magnetic component. And that is what causes charged particles to go around a magnetic field line in space. Because the Lorentz force creates the centripetal force. It's the force that holds it in orbit. So there's a centrifugal force which is trying to throw it out of the circle, and then there is a force that keeps it in the circle. And when the two are balanced, it maintains a path. So there's a fixed radius, 
at which a particle will go around a magnetic field if it's going at a certain speed and has a certain mass. If you increase the mass, it'll go on a bigger radius. And that is the basis for how you do uh, the uh, magnetic separation. For instance, when you have isotopes and you're separating them, you use magnetic field lines and they land in different points because the radius of revolution is different for each mass. So there are real applications every day that we use this. Again here, you can see that it's a vectorial sum of the two. And so you see how the F is the diagonal of the parallelogram that you see in the diagram. One side of the parallelogram is the magnetic force and the other one is the electric force. Let's now get into the concept of magnetic intensity. That's the letter H, and it has a relationship with the magnetic field strength. Essentially, H is B, so B over the permeability is H. But here we will show you from basic principles that if you had a current carrying conductor and they were a certain number of turns, then the magnetic intensity is given by the current times the number of turns divided by the length of the solenoid. And if the conductor was straight, there were no turns, n would be just one, and you would just have I over two pi r. So by this depiction, you're beginning to see the electrical relationships electromagnetic relationships and the geometric relationships. We're bringing them together. So for instance, if you look at the inductance, L, that is a function of the number of turns, the permeability, the cross-sectional area of the solenoid, and the length of the solenoid. That's N squared mu A over L. That's the inductance. And then that inductance can be substituted in the formula I times N over L and in order to show you the relationship between L and between the geometry and the magnetic side. So you have H on the left side and a bunch of geometric things on the right side. This is a very, very powerful tool. So if you know the current and you know the geometry, you can calculate the magnetic intensity because you know what the magnetic inductance is, the L. So this is showing you what happens when you have solenoids, coils of wire, in which you have a current running and there's a magnetic field that is created in the solenoid? Let's now get into the subject of capacitance. I spoke about it earlier when I showed you the displacement <coughs> vector, but essentially the capacitance is the charge per unit volt. So it's Q over V. So the more charge you can place across two plates for a certain voltage, the higher is your capacitance. And that's the key thing, is that there are some applications that require high capacitance because you use that essentially as storage for electric charge. So in a very small space, if you want to store a lot of charge, if you can put a very good dielectric material between the two plates, you can achieve that. But at the same time, you have to be careful when you have a lot of charge in a very small space that it can dissipate and dissipate rapidly and can cause harm. So like a lot of televisions in the old days, they used to tell you don't open the back and go fiddle around with a screwdriver because if you touch the capacitor, then it could be quite painful. But today, you know, with solid state type stuff, the voltages and stuff have come down considerably. So the likelihood of uh, getting hurt really bad, I mean, unless, of course, you're messing around with the power supply or something. But a lot of those dangerous capacitors have gone down. Uh, but I do want to say that capacitors are a very important contribution in the electric grid that is increasingly seeing inductive motor loads because this as you will see going forward, will be very important to balance it out. So if you have a lot of inductance, you'll need capacitance. So that is why it's so important to understand this. This slide shows you the geometric definition and the electric definition of capacitance. So if you have 
a certain area of the plate and a certain distance between the plates, epsilon A over D gives you the capacitance from geometric considerations. And if you know the charge and you know the voltage by doing a test in a lab, you can figure out capacitance the electric way. So if you notice in each slide, I'm trying to show you a physical concept and an electrical concept. And if you can bring the two together, it makes it much easier to solve problems in this field. Here is a capacitance for a coaxial geometry. So we're talking about an inner plate and an outer plate that are coaxial in the form of a cylinder. And in this case, the capacitance is a function of epsilon zero, of course, the length of the capacitor, and the natural log of the distance between the inner radius and outer radius, because they're two different annuli. There's one inside and one outside. And so it's important to understand. So you see how different it is from a plate and a coax. Now, this is a very common way of creating capacitors, is this cylindrical geometry. And I mentioned a couple of talks ago about how you can use electro technologies, for instance, to reduce the amount of precipitation that occurs in water-based systems using a capacitor like this, where the inside rod is several thousand kilovolts and the outside is grounded. And the electric field that is created, as you can see with the letter E in the diagram, that electric field can increase the amount of surface charge on impurities. And that allows the impurities not to stick together because the Coulomb repulsion will not let them. And so if they won't stick together, they will not precipitate and become food for the bacteria that will then produce SOX and NOx gases and cause microbial-induced corrosion. So here is an example of an application of a capacitor that will help reduce the amount of biofouling that occurs in water systems. I showed this in the previous presentation, but I think it's worthy of a review now that we understand resistance, inductance, and capacitance. If you have an AC circuit, what happens is that when the alternating current goes through the inductor, there is a reactance that it experiences. And the reason is because the magnetic field inside the coil is changing. And that changing magnetic field in the presence of a conductor by Faraday's law of induction induces a reverse EMF. In other words, the voltage uh, that is produced is opposite to the voltage of the circuit. So that is like a resistance. And that resistance is represented in magnitude by what's called the inductive reactance, or omega L. So the faster the frequency of change, the more will be the resistance. L is the inductance that we saw in a previous slide. Now the capacitive reactance, think of it like this. If you have an alternating current, you have for a while one plate positive and the other plate negative. And then when the current shifts, then the reverse happens and back and forth. Now if there was no change, if the current was flowing in one direction, a capacitor acts like a break in the cir uh, circuit two plates with the space. How is it going to get through? It'll stop. But because it's alternating, it has a path from the other side. So it keeps charging one plate and the other plate, back and forth. If it were to do it infinite number of times per second, it would look like a short in the circuit because it looks like the charge made it to the other side because it's going back and forth but the other way. So therefore, the capacitive reactance is inversely proportional to the frequency. The same way in an inductor, it is proportional to the frequency in a capacitor is inversely because of the phenomena that I just described. And so there are resonant situations because remember I said these are vectors. So the inductive reactance is positive and the capacitive reactance is negative, and they add like vectors. So if we had a special circumstance in which the two were equal, that would be a resonant circuit. In that, 
R and uh, the L and C contributions would be negligible, and the circuit would appear purely resistive. And that is also equivalent to when we say the power factor is unity, when we talk about in AC systems. That is the special situation in which all the inductive loads are being offset by the capacitive loads. And in that, maximum transfer of electric energy into mechanical work is possible because it's only the resistor that's going to do that, right? Loads, the, the pure one on the real axis is the one the, where we measure efficiency with. So all this inductive and capacitive losses are unnecessary. I mean, they are there because of the kind of loads we have, but we need to make sure that we get as close to unity as possible so that we minimize losses. When you have XL is greater than XC, we call that an inductive circuit. Those are the cases in a lot of customer premises with large inductive motors. And what I'm hearing is that by 2015, which is not that far away, 60% of motors could be inductive online. That is huge. I mean, we're moving in that direction because they have other benefits. So as a supplier of electricity, I'd be concerned about that. And I'd want to make sure that I have the appropriate capacitor banks or, for that matter, storage placed in certain locations to offset that phenomenon. Otherwise, I'm going to have a problem of throwing a lot of energy into the grid but not turning it into effective mechanical power on the other side or light power. If XC, X sub C is greater than X sub L, then we call that a capacitive. So it's just that there are more, there's more capacitive reactants on the circuit than there's inductive reactants. There's a concept of impedance, which is essentially a vector sum, again, of the real part and the imaginary part. The imaginary part is created by the inductor and capacitor, and the real part is created by the resistor. And its value is the value of the diagonal, of the Pythagorean diagonal. That's why it's square root of R squared plus X sub T squared. X sub T meaning the sum of the capacitive and reactive parts. So it's written in complex vector notation as R plus JX, as you can see on the other side. So impedance is a vector, it has a magnitude, and it has a direction. The direction is represented by the complex vector. The magnitude is measured by the diagonal of the Pythagorean triangle. Here is the example of Lenz's law. We've been talking about back EMF or negative voltage here is the example. If you took a magnet and tried to put it inside a solenoid, the magnetic field lines as they cut the conductor of the solenoid are going to induce a voltage. And that voltage is going to create a current such that the magnetic field that's created will try to oppose this motion. So you see how the north pole in the first diagram, as the north pole of the magnet is coming, it's going to induce a current in the solenoid in such a way that a north pole is created near that other north pole to repel it. So it doesn't want it to come in. And then when it's trying to go away, it will create a south pole to attract that north pole so it doesn't go away. It's kind of like human relationships almost. <laughs> so, so here is an example of Lenz's law that nature works in a way to resist change. Nature doesn't like change. That's all this is. When you're moving the magnet in a solenoid, you're creating change. You're cutting magnetic lines of force. So nature will say, no, no, don't do that. You know, it's like when you exercise and your metabolism gets even slower and slower, and you're like, why am I not losing weight? Nature says, you know, be fat and be happy. You know, because they're, it, human beings, you know, are conditioned like from centuries of trying to hold food because you never know when you will not have food. So the body is kind of programmed like that. So all these aspects of nature work against us, gravity and a whole variety of things. Here's an example. Look at the diagrams in the bottom. If I don't move the magnet, nothing happens. There's no current induced in the loop. But when I... In do move the magnet to see how the current flows in such a way that the magnetic field 
repels it, and then when it moves away, it again goes in the opposite direction to try to stop that from getting away. This is very, very important because this is the kind of inertia that we need to deal with. Now, the nice thing is that th there is this phenomena from inductance and an opposite phenomena from capacitance, and we can play games to offset one with the other. But it's there, and we need to consider this. Faraday's law come in a variety of ways. There are many manifestations, but essentially it's all about relative motion. That's what causes the induction. So here, the first example is that maybe a change in current changes the magnetic flux. And there's voltage created as a result of that changing flux. In the second case at the bottom left, you have a magnet moving into a solenoid. Again, magnetic field lines cutting this way, as opposed to the current changing and the magnetic field lines changing. Here there's a physical movement of a magnet that causes the magnetic lines to cut. In the top right corner, you have an example of a loop that's physically cutting across a magnetic field region, and that is inducing a voltage in the wire, in the loop. And then in the fourth case, which is the example of the AC generator, you have a magnet that's rotating in a magnetic field. So the magnet is created by a DC current in a loop in an AC generator. And when it rotates between three solenoids, that induces a magnetic field in the DC loop, and then when that loop cuts those conductors in the three solenoids, you get the three phases of electricity out of a generator. So here's the f bottom right corner is the example by which commercial AC generators work. Again, the main thing is that changing flux with respect to time creates a voltage. That's Faraday's law that when you have magnetic flux lines being cut by a conductor, it causes a voltage to be created. But how that happens, all these ways are options of doing that. But it's always relative motion that's causing it. Here we have Gauss's law. Gauss's law simply says that if you had a surface around a charge and you were to take the integral of the electric field over the entire surface, that's the closed loop integral, E dot dA with the little circle, that means a closed surface. It equals the charge that's inside that surface divided by epsilon zero. That's Gauss's law for electricity. I wanted to show it to you graphically so that you understand what this integral means physically. Now let's move on to Ampere's law. Ampere's law says that essentially when you have a current carrying conductor, there's a magnetic field line that is created. And if you were to integrate the magnetic field strength on this loop, closed loop, you will get mu zero times the current contained inside the loop. That's the I, mu zero I. If there was a changing electric field, then there is an additional term. And that's why in freshman physics they drop that out. But in reality, it exists. But if the, there was a constant, the electric field was not changing, the potential was constant, then you could drop that term. So here is an example of how physical phenomena and electrical phenomena are interrelated. You see a way of measuring the magnetic field strength from a current carrying conductor. Now let's get into some vector calculus, because if I've shown you all these rules and I've shown you some of the electrical concepts, but you will not fully appreciate Maxwell's equations unless you've had a good review of vector calculus. This is the subject that most people as an elective say, oh, I'm not going to take it. They only take it if they are really in heavy duty science and engineering, and then in some schools, they require it. In other schools, they find a way around it. But I have to tell you that this is the art. If you want to see beauty in physics, you have to understand vector calculus. If you don't understand vector calculus, you will not understand the subtleties 
of electromagnetic theory. You will be looking at manifestations of electromagnetic theory much like a 3D movie is shown in 2D. You'll just see impressions of it, but it will not dance in your head in three dimensions. For that, you need this vector calculus notation. There are three functions that are very important, and I'm going to go over the definitions of each of them. The first one is the divergence of a vector. So a vector field has magnitude and direction, so think of it as a bunch of arrows. And what divergence does is it says, if you took a very, very small volume in this space where this field is going through, and you were to count the number of lines going into the cube and how many are coming out, what's the difference between them? And if the difference is zero, that means there's no source inside that volume. Or if there is a source, there's an opposite of its kind in there. So for instance, when we say that the divergence of the magnetic field strength is zero, it means that there are no magnetic monopoles because every magnetic pole north has a south in there. So as many lines will go in as will come out, the net will be zero. So this is an example, physical example of what divergence is. And it's mathematically, you take the x and y component of the function of the vector field, and you take its derivatives with respect to x and res with respect to y and add them together. It ends up in a scalar. It's a number. It's not a vector. Notice how the vectorial aspect of it goes away by performing the divergence function. The gradient, now since I you know, grew up in the Middle East with lots of carpets and everything, I like to describe gradient with carpets. So for instance, if you think of carpet, it's like a three-dimensional function, right? It's two dimensions, and then the third one is the f. So it's f of x, y. Think of a carpet like f of x, y. And it has, you know, when it's flying in the air, of course, it has peaks and it has troughs. So if you were sitting at any one location and you moved around on the carpet in every direction and said, which is the direction in which the slope is the steepest? That is the direction of the vector of the gradient of a function. So you're on this magic carpet and you're at a particular location and you go around in every direction seeking the direction where the slope is the greatest on the carpet. And that is a vector. That's the direction you're pointing. So how do we calculate it? We take the function, we take its derivative with respect to x, its derivative with respect to y, its derivative with respect to z. And for those of you who are not familiar with partial derivatives, when you take a partial derivative, you consider all the other variables constant. And therefore, you think of them like numbers. And you're only focused on x when you take a derivative with respect to x. Only on y when it's y, and only on z when it's z. Now, I've kept it simple. This can get really, really complicated when you start speaking in spherical coordinates with r, theta, and phi. But for simplicity, I'm just going to keep it in Cartesian coordinates for you. The next term is the curl. Now, the curl, vectorial fields may have a rotational element to them. They may be turning. So the curl is a vector that has magnitude and direction. The magnitude is how much it's rotating. The direction is determined by the right-hand rule. Again, if the vector field is turning along my uh, fingers, the thumb is pointing in the direction of the curl. But there's a physical manifestation in the form of a limit. The curl is a ratio of two competing things. It's a line integral on the contours of a surface, as you can see in this diagram, and the area of the surface. As the surface area goes to zero, so it's a competition between the line integral and the area. So as the area is going to zero, if the line integral goes to zero faster than the physical area goes to zero, the curl is zero. And if the curl is zero, it, the field is called conservative. 
and conservative fields when you integrate them, all you have to worry about is the difference between the two points. You don't have to worry about the path you're taking. It's called path independent. And voltage is like that. So when you take the integral of E dot DL, as I did before, the electric field integrated over a curve, you're just taking the difference between the voltage at one point and the voltage at another. Remember VA minus VB back there about 10 or 15 slides ago? Path independent, doesn't matter how you go. You just take it here, you take it here, and you're done. The curl is represented by a determinant in three dimensions. That is what this is. And that's just a convenient way of showing it because it's easier to write the formula once you put it in this form. And as you can see, when you take a three by three determinant and you solve it, when you solve the determinant three by three, you take the I column, the left column, and the top row and cut it out, and then you go AD minus PC. That gives you the partial with respect to R, partial of R with respect to Y minus the partial of Q with respect to Z. Notice I take the top, the left column out and the top row out. I'm left with a two by two determinant. And I do AD minus BZ, you know, primary diagonal minus secondary diagonal. That's the first term. Then in the second term, I take the middle column out and I take the top row out and I'm left with the four terms on the four on the corners of the determinant. And then I do a reverse. So it's BC minus AD. And that gives you the partial of P with respect to Z minus the partial of R with respect to X. That's the J term. And the K term is determined by taking out the K column and the top row and then going back to AD minus BC of the remaining two by two determinant. That's partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y, and that's the K term. So this is how you solve for the curl of a function. And the curl of a function is really, really important because two of Maxwell's equations depend on this function. And understanding it physically first will help you understand it when you see it in Maxwell's equations. And we are coming close to the end of our presentation. Uh, so I just have a couple more terms and some theorems to share with you. Stokes theorem, I mean, when they say, I'm really stoked, I know what they mean. Because when I saw this, I said, this is really cool. Here, you have a line integral that is being equated to a surface integral of the curl of the same function. So curl of f. So what it means is if you took the curl of a vector field F and integrated it over the whole surface that I've show, I'm showing you in the diagram, it is the same as taking the line integral of the vector field along the contour that is on the rim of that surface. So think of the surface as like a cap and it has a rim on it. So if you took the surface integral of the curl of the function on the surface, it's the same as taking the line integral of the same vector field along the contours of the surface. This is an amazing concept. Now, how they figured this out, I don't know. But once they did, it made life much easier in solving Maxwell's equations. So I just wanted to show you physically and mathematically what this is. Now, if you didn't know what curl was, you would just skip over this and say, I don't know what they're talking about. But now that we know the subtle intricacies of curl, we can understand Stokes' theorem. Divergence theorem is also very cool. Divergence theorem <coughs> says that if I took a function and took its divergence, I mentioned what divergence was earlier. It's, remember what the divergence was? It was the difference between in and out lines in a volume. So if I took the divergence of a function and integrated it within a volume, it's the same as taking the surface integral of the function on the surface that encloses that volume. See, divergence of the volume, and on the other side is the surface integral of the surface that bounds that volume. Profound stuff. I mean, it's amazing when you don't have electronic media, how much time you have to sit and think about these things. Can you imagine in this day and age coming up with things like this, with iPod and iPad and 
I mean, we are so distracted. These people at a very young age determine these things. I mean, I haven't even gotten into Fourier and Pascal and all those people. It's amazing. But this phenomena becomes like the basis for electromagnetic theory, these relationships. Green's theorem is just a special case of Stokes' theorem in two dimensions. Notice it only has x and y. And if you look at it, it's nothing but the curl of the function integrated over a surface on the right side. And on this side, it's the line integral. So this is Stokes' theorem, but in two dimensions. Now I'm going to quickly bring you to those four Maxwell's equations I brought last time. But now they make so much more sense if I see Stokes' theorem and divergence theorem and start applying them. So if I took the left side and I integrated the left side with a surface integral, by Stokes' theorem, it would become the line integral. So you see how the integral form came out of that? So for instance, if I did an, an integral of curl of h with respect to a surface, by Stokes' theorem, it becomes the line integral of the contour at the bottom of the surface. So that's the left side. And the right side still has a surface integral. So I'm taking a surface integral of both sides of Maxwell's equation, the first equation, and I get the right side by Stokes' theorem. The same thing if I apply a surface integral on both sides of the second equation, by Stokes' theorem, the left side becomes e dot dl, and the right side still has the surface integral. If I use the divergence theorem on the third equation, I do an integral with respect to volume, on the left side, and I do the same thing on the right side. But on the left side, by divergence theorem, it becomes a surface integral of the surface that bounds that volume. So that's Gauss's law. And divergence of B, if I integrate the left side with respect to volume and apply the divergence theorem, I just get a surface integral of the surface bounding the volume, and that's the integral of B dot ds. So by using Stokes' theorem and divergence theorem on the point form of Maxwell's equations, I can now get the integral forms. The integral forms are much easier to solve. And that's why this is the, the description that is put in a lot of textbooks that are taught in undergraduate. Why are these relationships important? Because they relate electricity with magnetism. And they also relate electricity and magnetism with physical phenomena. Which media are you in? What is your geometry? You know, those kinds of things. How far are you away from something? So now you can begin to see the waltz that's going on of physics, math, and intuition, and understanding multidimensional phenomena. Electromagnetic waves don't just travel along the x-axis. You can make them, but they're not limited to that. And as a result of varying media, they can change direction. We learned that. It's called refraction, right? And in atmosphere, it can be so gradual that they'll actually bend. Like they'll be a, almost, they'll become horizontal. So when you see, for instance, the in a desert, when you see that shimmering light, what you're really seeing is the bending of sunlight in the layers of the atmosphere until it becomes horizontal. So you're actually seeing the sun, even though it's up there, but it's bending the light in the same way a fiber optic tube would bend the light. Now, all this stuff doesn't happen magically. It happens because these interrelationships exist, and as the media changes, the direction of the electromagnetic wave will change because you're solving this integral equation. And the next time I will speak about how these equations turn into dispersion relations, which is the relationship between frequency and wavelength of an electromagnetic wave. And then you can start thinking about encoding it with data and, and all the other stuff. Okay, so we have the d'Alembert wave equation. And the d'Alembert wave equation is essentially, if you take the curl of the curl of a function, there's a vector identity that says that it is equal to the gradient of the divergence of the function minus the Laplacian of the function. 
del squared is Laplacian. It means divergence of the gradient of the function. So you can see it's the opposite rule. You know, remember, derivative of the first so minus the second minus the first times the derivative of the first. Remember that quotient rule we used to use? Okay, so the same concept, or even in the product rule, it's the derivative of first times the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Remember that the product rule in calculus? That is being applied here in vector calculus. So when you apply this to Maxwell's equation on the Faraday's law of induction, you see that the curl of the curl of E will equal minus del squared E. And why is it minus del squared E? Because the gradient of the divergence of E will go to zero. Why will it go to zero? Because this is dealing in free space. There's no charge, so divergence of E will be zero. There's no charge distribution there. Okay, so th that uh, first term goes away, and that you're left with minus del squared. On the other side of the equation, of Maxwell's equation, now let me go back. I'm, I'm basically dealing with the second equation here. So when I took the curl of both sides of the equation, I have to take the curl of the right side also, and that's where that term, that curl of H is coming. Remember that H and B are related, right? Because it's just B over mu is H. So when you solve this equation, look how beautiful it turns out. That a second order derivative in space, which is what del squared E is, is equal to something times a second order derivative of E with respect to time. Just think about that. That electromagnetic waves have a relationship between space and time, such that a second order derivative in space is proportional to a second order derivative in time. And the only class of functions that solve that kind of problem are sines and cosines. And that's why electromagnetic wave formations are in the form of sines and cosines. Because mathematically, those are the only class of functions. It's the e to the i k r plus minus omega t plus phi. And by Euler's equation, e to the i k is cosine plus i sine, right? So it's sines and cosines basically. Just think about that. It's not triangular, it's not square, it's sines and cosines. And do you know that today even your square waves that you make are nothing more than high frequency sines and cosines added onto a primary frequency. That's if you do the Fourier analysis of any wave function, it's just a bunch of coefficients and different frequency harmonics on top of the primary frequency. So once again, Maxwell's equations rule. There's no such thing as a triangular wave or a square wave. It's our approximation of sines and cosines that create them. So there's no violation of electromagnetic theory of Maxwell's equation just because you have a square function. It's just a bunch of things. It's got the 11 herbs and spices in it. KFC, right? <laughs> okay. Moving along, there is an equivalent if you took the curl of the curl of B, again, this is the first Maxwell's equation that I had up there, the Ampere's law. Let me show it to you again. So the first equation, if I took the curl of both sides, that's how I'm going to end up with this equation. And here, the magnetic field strength is being shown as a relationship between space and time, that the second order derivative of the magnetic field strength is proportional to the second order time derivative of the magnetic field strength. Once again, B will also be in the form of sines and cosines. So if E is in sines and cosines and B is in sines and cosines, all they are are polarized 90 degrees apart and they pump each other. The magnetic field pumps the electric field, the electric field pumps the magnetic field. And that's why I make the example of the people who in the old days when they would run up and down on the railroad track with their manual pumping action and the car would move. That's how I think of electricity and magnetism, that one is pumping the other. And both of them together in harmony are carrying energy from point A to point B and allowing programs like Star Trek to have some meaning. Whole idea of energizing people and sending them over. <coughs> yes. All right.
I'm just trying to wake people up because I know you've gone into deep REM sleep by now. <laughs> so this is my way of waking you guys up. So if we have the electric field and the magnetic field wave representation as shown in the diagram and also the functions that will solve that differential equation, the diagram shows you also a physical manifestation of how an electric field and a magnetic field polarized 90 degrees apart will carry this information or energy. The next set of topics for September, I will talk a little bit about how electricity flows on the grid because the AC voltage is also kind of like a wave that's traveling on a wire. And so there, there's a phenomena by which that occurs. And if you understand that, then you will understand what happens in an AC transformer as the changing current in the primary coil will induce a secondary voltage in the secondary coil, which will then either be stepped up or stepped down based on the ratio of the number of turns. And what happens in a two-way energy flow? Now a wave is coming in from a solar or a wind farm or somewhere else. How will all this song and dance occur? I mean, is it like turbulent flow, like in water? You know, imagine if you have a bunch of pipes that are pumping into a main hose. It will be very, very turbulent. So there are ways in which you deal with that. And think of potential as the pressure in the water. So I just give you an equivalent feeling. So there are ways in which you stabilize that to make sure that laminar flow continues to exist in pipe flow because turbulent flow can cause a lot of damage. Similarly, in a grid, the way energy will come and go has to also be balanced, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then once we now understand what the physical and the electromagnetic basis for EM waves is, then we can start seeing how we can take phase and amplitude and frequency and play with it to encode it with data, either by shifting the frequency or shifting the amplitude or shifting the phase, we can store data in it. And that, those are ways in which you can carry digital data on analog waves. There's no such thing. I mean, when we say they're digital data, but it's really happening on analog phenomena. It's just that we encode it and pull out from it digital information. And then, what are some of the performance metrics for electromagnetic wave propagation? Path loss, for instance. Things that happen in different media. You know, you get some absorption of the wave. There are eddy currents that are created in materials that, in which an electromagnetic wave goes, and it kills, it slowly starts killing the energy. I mean, it starts absorbing the energy. So the signal starts getting weaker. And at some point, the noise, the background noise, will exceed the signal energy. And at that point, the data is not discernible. And essentially, you're out of data then. So essentially, the, if you understand EM wave propagation and you understand the performance metrics, you can design better so that your reliability of communication goes up. And at this point, I will open it up for uh, questions. Uh, any questions you have, please ask Ma Maxwell. He's the cause of all of this. My job was just to tell you about it. <laughs> but let's see. We may have some questions. OK. Any questions? I can go back to the queue. I think I I have lots of people on the call, but I will ask again if anyone has any questions, anything for clarification on any of the concepts, uh, please let me know online. There may be some questions here. You can be heard. Okay. I think you've just blown them all in the weeds, or <laughs> <laughs> Are there situations where there are violations? Are you talking about uh, violations to Maxwell's equations? William Miller? Okay. 
I think it's a matter of representation. If you don't properly characterize the media in which you are analyzing Maxwell's equations, you may find a discrepancy between your mathematical solution and the empirical performance. But that's just a result of you not characterizing the media properly. So there is nothing in this. I mean, if we take the theory of relativity as a given, and we say that speed of light is a constant in a certain media, then Maxwell's equations will remain consistent. I think it's just a matter of how accurately have you characterized the environment in which you're solving Maxwell's equations. And that's where you may find seem a apparent discrepancy because when you solve it mathematically and when you do an experiment, you find a discrepancy. And I have found such an anomaly. In fact, my PhD dissertation is exactly on a subject in which the empirical results boggled the minds of the physicists who were studying the anomalous uh, dissipation of energy from very hot plasmas. And it involved Maxwell's equations. But by creating a more realistic theoretical model, I was able to explain the anomalous loss. If I had kept the more simplistic model, then the empirical results would not be explained. So William, I would Oh, so it says, please discuss large-scale storage using capacitors. Ah, the energy stored in a capacitor is one-half CV squared, where C is the capacitance in farads, and V is the voltage in volts. So one-half CV squared is measured in kilowatt hours. And it can be many, 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 many. I mean, well, actually, it's measured in joules, and then there's an equivalent to kilowatt hours. So. It's a very good way of storing energy. It's, uh, you know, when you have no other recourse, I would recommend it. But ultimately, the issue is not about how big a storage you create, but where you put it. Because there are shielding effects on the grid that we experience. And so having an intelligent distribution of such storage will be good. But uh, according to what you're saying, William, I would s highly recommend capacitors as storage if you don't have access to a lot of other types of electric storage. Uh, another good thing about capacitors is that they can discharge fast. You can get good response from them. Uh, certain batteries, you know, they vary. So some of them, like lithium ion, is very good, very fast response. I think sodium sulfur is a little slower but can give you more in terms of quantity. So there are those trade-offs that you do. OK. You did an excellent job in explaining and simplifying very difficult laws of physics. Congratulations. Oh, that's nice. Other questions from the audience? We only have a few minutes in this room, so I would encourage the people online to ask questions quickly. There is a meeting that will be coming up very soon. And we have to have prep time for it. If we had time, so on, I would uh, take one of those questions. Go back to the calculation and calculate the surface area for a given voltage for a capacitor. That would answer his question. Yes. Okay. Yes. But we need more time. For Other that. questions online? And as I mentioned, uh, I the, there will be another talk uh, in which I'm going to be talking about the applications of all of this. So there will be less math and more engineering in the following. But I wanted to show you the basis from math and physics of a very important area which unfortunately has not gotten much attention over the last 30 years in schools. And the result is obvious that we have a huge skills gap. I mean, I'm just rem remembering stuff from being a 17-year-old, but if you ask me how many years have I spent in the last 31 years solving Maxwell's equations, not many. But I was taught by a guy who just danced with the stuff, and I still see him in my mind to this day. I mean, he, had, he passed away 11 years ago, but he left an incredible reservoir of knowledge. So I would recommend that after this, if, when you look at your EM theory book again, you know, dust it, bring it out again, show it the light of day, 
And you will see that these things will not look as Greek to you as they used to. I will also uh, remind you that August 27th, which will be our next webinar, Ray Hayes, who was previously with American Electric Power and was very active in the Dolan Research Lab over there, is going to be talking about how you establish a test bed and also a test plan for smart grid. And this is going to be very important because he has been directly involved in that at AEP, and then he was also doing some work with NIST and a few other entities. So I think it would be very valuable. So this will happen two weeks from today, same time, and uh, Ray Hayes will be giving. And this is actually a teaser of a workshop that he's doing for the CITER Energy Academy. So I'm encouraging a lot of the utilities and integrators and others who are involved in this area to watch this, and if they're interested in his two-day workshop, let me know. And with that, uh, I'm going to bring this uh, call to a close since I don't see any more questions. Do you see any more questions? Oh, there is. There is a question from Ray Hayes. What is the effect of power factor correction reducing reactive impedance on fault current? I would think it would reduce the fault current. Is he talking about the fault current, like in a fault current detector that is used in a circuit breaker? Is that what he's worried about? I don't think there's an effect. Ray, would you like to elaborate on this question a little bit more for the sake of the audience here in the room on what fault current you're referring to? Fault current is determined by the line impedance. Yes, yeah, so if the line impedance would go down. Yeah. Yes. So the line impedance would go down, so the fault current would reduce because you're, we're, we're talking about is trying to get to that resonant position. So the impedance would be a minimum. Mm -hmm. All fine. <coughs> yes? Yeah. Okay. So with that, uh, I will uh, bring this uh, presentation to a close. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, I think I'm giving the Ambien tablet some competition with this class. So in case you don't want an addictive form of falling asleep, please watch this presentation often. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you, and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the week.